uh, hi guys. Um, it's wonderful having you here again. We we'll are yeah, heading into the first of our modules, and then um, it promises to be enlightening. The topic before us would be introductions and overview, and um, we'll be looking at it from subsessions as laid out here. Definition of PPP. PPP versus privatization, key concepts, uh, rationales for this subject, types of PPP and common PPP infrastructure. Um, PPP, even to you, I believe you are not new to this. That's why you could even appreciate the course and determine that I want to give this a dash. So PPP is a public service or private business venture which is funded and operated through a partnership of governments and one or more private sector companies. We say one or more because it can be an arrangement of private, a group of private companies trying to forge a relationship with the government. And we'll see that shortly in, in subsequent um, conversations. Um, Definitions, just as we have earlier stated, there are moderate um, considerations here and there, but the trust is always still the same. It's an agreement between the government and the private sector for provision of a public good or service. Yeah. It's also traditionally focuses on financing, construction management of other infrastructures. But that is a point of view it's not just restricted to hard infrastructures. PPP is applicable to services too. So as you earlier saw, public goods or services. So PPP are now in all sectors, including social sector, health, education, and all. So, so you'll be sure that you have your court in the kick, regardless of which sector you are. And then you, 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 you have a lot of value to derive. Yeah. So PPP versus privatization, um, caution, PPP is not privatization. So there is a lot of misconceptions. You read the news and uh, sometimes it's wrongly reported. Sometimes you read it right, but you, you by your default mind, you are thinking, oh, the government has privatized, has done this. No, that's not the case. PPP involves private management of public services. And sometimes it's for the common good. Yeah, because um, private sector have more, 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 more great with operation in whatever they stick their funds to, you know? So uh, with the end of deriving value for themselves or else they run out of business or also giving value to those who they are serving or else they will either way, equally run out of business. So sometimes PPP are better modalities for offering services, public services. So PPP is pretty much about risk and rewards. Private sector take the risk of taking their funds to render some public services, of, of lifting the responsibilities from the government. And also they work it out to see that they're also well rewarded so that there is a as is, they, 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 it's it's reasonable and economically justifiable to to commit to such an economic venture. Yeah. So we also understand that PPP, in a way, it's a private finance initiative where the private sector take their funds, depending on the nature of the contract, um, to provide such necessary public good or service. It can be a PPP arrangement to run a general hospital. It can be a PPP arrangement to, to build and operate a stadium. You can, and all of those. Um, public party procuring authority. We also understand that in the PPP arrangement, we have the public party, we have the private party. The public party is typically considered as the procuring authority. Procuring authority is the person who is 
needing the service. And this is the, in this case, is the public sector, the government. So if government is to build maybe a major road and they feel they want a private, public private partnership to do that, depending on the nature of the contract, they are procuring whoever will deliver the service. And so that's it. Government agency or agencies, typically MDAs. And sometimes governments can float a company, you get me? And so anything representing the government in the material sense is a public party. Yeah. The private party in this case is the company. And as I earlier said, government can float the company, but the company in this case that is procuring the um, offering the service, it's not necessarily that of the government, you know, you, 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 like in South Africa, you know, or like in Nigeria, before we privatized the power sector, we have the National Electricity Power Authority, NEPA. So, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's a company, it's offering the service of this, this delivering power, but it is government. Even in the NEPA, they can have subsets of their services they want to privatize. So that's public sector, even though it's a company, but now in a private sector sense, a company or group of companies, so maybe a Siemens, a G, General Electric, they are also power sector players and they want to offer a service, maybe to NEPA, there's also a public sector company. Okay, so, so there's a little dichotomy, shouldn't more do why we say company, or sometimes you want to place a lens, is this a government company or a private company? And so private companies would be involved in the delivery of the projects as contractual parties, counterparties to the public party. So, so you can have, a government company and a private company in a in a collaboration, which might be a form of a PPP, um, um, consortium, a group of companies, a group of private parties coming together to bid for a PPP com contract. So, yeah, two or more companies can pull forces, maybe because of the size of the financial commitment. Maybe because of different pockets of responsibilities, each of the companies coming to pull force together are specialized in and can handle effectively. So there will be some sound rationale for the synergy, but such happens. And in such a case, it's a consortium. And we sometimes name them special purpose vehicles dedicated for this. After the project, their, their, their bonds might be undone and they all go their separate ways, but for the project, they, they can pull an alliance and be one, negotiating with the government as well. Um, yeah, sometimes in a, in a construction project, a bank can be a member of the consortium if they are interested in, if they are interested in the project, and depending on the dynamics of all the parties that want to make up the project. Um, that said, um, other issues, I've spoken about special purpose vehicle. It's quite close to the issue we spoke about in, in a consortium. Um, we also look at greenfield projects. Greenfield projects, this is a case where we have new project areas, new infrastructure, new, new issues, new, 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 new things to really do. Like it's not existing before then. I mean, there might be several roads, but this very road to be constructed is just a new decision, is a new project for those who are going to venture into it. So it's a greenfield project. Brownfield project will be existing project. It has already been done, maybe by the government before, or by some previous private parties who we are maybe in an initial PPP. And because PPP has a lifespan and might be rolled over and succession to a new party, depending on what necessitates that. So any party that comes into an existing project, 
that project to such a party is a brownfield project. And sometimes it might not be to come and reconstruct it. It might be to maintain, to operate, and all of those. Mm. So yellow or secondary stage, um, yellow fields, secondary stage projects, and um, this one relates to PPP where investment is related to significant renewal, refurbishment, or substantial expansion of existing infrastructure. So it's it's neighbors brownfield project, but in this case, um, there is substantial improvement. So you can have a narrow road and you really want to make it a five carriage way. And this, this is a one, a dual carriage way before. If you want to multiply it or you want to transform a broadway with a light rail gauge in between. Yes, there's an existing project there. You can't really call it a brownfield because you are not just coming to maintain and service what is existing. You are doing a substantial transformation. You are trying to expand the scope of what is existing and all. So in such case, it's yellow field. It's secondary stage. Um, that's that. Um, so PPP contract. The other concept would be playing around with so much in this course. It's a written document comprising the rights and obligations enforceable by either party. So understand that very clearly. PVP contract helps to ensure every party's interest is well served. And it's good it's written so that there will be something to fall back to as evidence. It's a legal instrument, usually with attachments identifying, identified as bindings. Um, normally, a typical PPP contract spans 20, 25, 30 years, depending on the nature of the contract. And there could be contracts that span to 50 years, but good global best practices and have often averages 25, 30 years. Um, so rationales for PPPs. Main rationale is to one of the rationales to increase efficiency in service delivery. Sometimes the government sometimes might be too big to function efficiently in small spaces. You get me. And so PP services might help access alternative funding mechanisms. Well, before I go into this, you know, there might be many routes under the government profess to pay attention to. So the government might not be too close enough to pay attention to repairing a road until maybe the road is severely bad and becomes an headline news. But not. But in a case where there's a PPP arrangement, the private sector know that this is their chunk and the whole gamut of many of the government's road infrastructure. And we can always look at that as at when do you keep it in the best state. And so you won't have worries that this road is going severely bad, you know? All, all, so, so those are the points where PPPs help improve the efficiency in public service delivery. It's government's duties to improve, repair these roads. Maybe because of procurement procedures, times might go, but private sector don't, don't have that heavy bureaucratic processes to getting things done. So once you've um, entered into a PPP contract, you always find more efficiency in the delivery of those. Um, um, access alternative funding mechanisms. Oftentimes, the government will commit to doing a project, repairing a, a service or, or a project. It will always leverage its budget, fiscal purpose, but or maybe debt. Yeah, and all of those still boils down to the budget, um, whether it's positive or negative balance. But with PPP, government can net off its um, its its costs over a period of time, and then um, have the private sector take a lump sum of money. So a project that needs. 10 billion and government readily doesn't have a 10 billion for such a project but the project is necessary it needs to be done now 
what the government can do is if there's a value for money case or a, a value for money case for the economy, they can enter into a PPP and then and have the private sectors take their money. They can always pull the money, maybe as a consortium. And over a period of time, maybe through service payments from users or government paying over a period of time, not as we pay in debt, but based on terms of contract. It might be based on usage, based on, based on um, volume and all of those government will pay. So imagine government paying for a project it could have spent 10 billion at a, a, a lump sum over the next 20 years. If it spreads it, it will mean it has more money to do several other things. So it can manage its limited finance to cater for several priorities within the economy while still expediting needed development. So that's the or considerations about alternative funding mechanisms. Um, meet, meet increased demands for public services. So as I earlier alluded, if government has 100 billion, and that 100 billion can do 10 projects if it's had to spend the money. But with the leverage of PPP, it might just need to spend 1, 1 billion per, per, per project, while the private sector are putting their funds and with the structures of feasibility assessments and all of this, they might be able to make up the monies and yet government will be able to spread its 1 billion across 100 projects, which is equivalent to its 100 billion budget. So that's a very, that's a very basic illustration. It's, it's preliminary, but it just gives you an eye opener to why it's, it's a good option um, yeah and then greater access to technology people and skills so imagine when government democratizes accommodates the private sector into key sectors like power sector and all of those you will see an inflow of innovation the, skill, the companies bring their proprietary competencies do things that even if government had procured, had embarked on the project itself, it might not necessarily achieve that. So, and um, R and D, mainstream the R and D initiatives of these people, and and deliver more value to the public through the whole arrangement. Um, so uh, there are a lot of them. Um, um, rationales for this, um, but you can always fall back to the slides to look at those. Um, very quickly, we'll look at the types of PPP. I had also alluded to this, user PPPP, government PPPP. User PPPP might take the form of concessions. I've used, experienced the situation of roads where they collect toll, toll, toll fees. So many times it's not the government collecting that, but I mean, to the layman, they would see it as the government. It's the private sector players that, that, that provided that service on behalf of the government. So if the government hadn't done that, the government might have needed to sink a huge budget, budget allocation to do that road, to do that project. Why there are health priorities, why there are many other things to attend to. But if the government, private sector comes take their funds, the government might even not need to pay them. They might come with a, a feasibility plan, a commercial plan to say that, oh, if we do this road, we envisage so, so, so number of usage by motorists and um, in different grades, maybe trucks would pay 15 naira. Per, 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 per day and all of this. And they would have a, have a feasibility analysis, commercial viability analysis and see that. If we run it like this for the next 20 years, we would make both the money we invest in this project and would also be profitable. So in the end, the public service is delivered, but the government adding any, didn't add no need to stake any fund. That's another loose illustration, but 
very, 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 very resilient. So sometimes PPP helps government to achieve what it would not necessarily need to stick funds for, um, depending on the modalities of the contract. Um, so um, there is a case of government pay PPP, and that still applies. In the case where there needs to be a road, but in the considerations of the profiling, the economic status of the community and all of those, the government might find it ethical not to belabor the whole populace with paying some token, um, depending on the nature of the consideration, and might enter an agreement that, okay, as you offer this service, for every 100 usage of the road you construct, we would pay so, 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 so. And so that, that might be a government pay. Or even it might be a mix of user pay, government pay, but in this case, the government is saying that we will subsidize what the users will pay. So if, if it's meant to be that 200 naira per day for every user of this road, we would pay 70 and you can just charge 130, you know? And so in the end, government really didn't need to sink the whole money to build that road and they have subsidized um, the life of the people who would benefit from that. And oftentimes the choices about what to be paid are not just ad hoc. They are subject to a lot of analysis. You would see it, cost benefit analysis, all of those. You would profile the economic status of the people. You would, you would see what a threshold that is workable um, for the people not to be overburdening and all of those. So, so in the end, there is always a middle ground. Um, so types of PPP, I wouldn't run through this, but you can always go through it. You would see, we have marked it to tell you that for each type of PPP, these are the features that make up those types. I build, operate and transfer. This is a mode of PPP where the private sector that participates in this arrangement builds the project. It, in this case, this should be a green field or a, a, a brownfield if, if it's a case of renovation. The, op, the private sector operates the project. The private sector transfers the project after the given lifetime of the PPP contract. You see, you, you can always follow the logic and, and understand what, what plays out for other sectors too. Yeah. Um, so reparation, repartition of the risks by private PPP. So oftentimes all I had illustrated so far about government bequeathing is some of its responsibilities to the public sector, to the private sector to carry out um, some services is can be reduced to the concept of risk sharing. Government bequeaths that risk to you. I don't need to commit to the financial risk of this project, do it, or operational risks come and bear this burden. And, and in the end, the private sector makes a value for money analysis for why it should commit to that, you know? And before each party enters into the contract, everybody, every party is satisfied that this is a, 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 a good win, a good sale. And so you will see in the build, operate and transfer, the government bears the risk of design, might bear the risk of design. Each party might have a stake in the processes. While the, while the private sector and the government might share the risk of co-building, so the government might stake a 40% into the financing of the project, and the private sector might bring 60%. I'm just giving you a loose idea of how this works, but in the end, it's a co-creation. Are you with me? Operation, the, the private sector might solely operate based on maybe their competence, and then the private sector solely transfers. You get me. There are other times where government, all the government needs to do is to just give give their own stake in the PPP arrangement is their goodwill. There are times all the government has in a project is maybe pro providing land, providing other things like security, providing and and if you estimate those financially too, there will be a chunk of money, but they are in time. So 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 we look at the PPP process holistically assesses all that goes into making the arrangement works. And so it's it's a win-win for both parties based on how it is negotiated. Um, 
so common PPP infrastructures, uh, we have economic infrastructure, we have social infrastructure, economic infrastructure in the sense that these infrastructures are revenue earning. So they would in a way pay, they, they have a revenue model. Social infrastructure many times are for social good without any intent for making any money from that. So you can see airport, you pay, you pay, you no know, free airport anywhere, and it's still a public good. It's a public infrastructure with public services, but that's an economic infrastructure in that case. But you also see in another light, maybe a primary health care, where they deliver, they offer a lot of free medical services, um, public health services, vaccinations, and all of those. And that's a social good. And it can still be operated through a PPP. But you need to know that all PPP services can be delivered either as an economic infrastructure or a social infrastructure. Um, the option, the, the considerations are many here. You can see those. Um, uh, I think uh, when you take your time to look at this slide and then digest it for yourself, we would be happy to have you on the discussion board to interact on key issues that are prominent on your mind. We might want to see you engage on the possibilities of PPP reducing the infrastructure gap in Africa. If yes, how? And if no, why not? You know, it's a good engagement to try. What are the challenges of implementing successful PPP projects? I mean, yeah, you can bring in the context of your client, if you've seen. And many times, the reason why we need a framework and all of this we are looking at is because to make it ethical. There are times, you know, corruption and all of those. And so, so we might want to hear you out on all of this. And so if we follow a PPP in global best practice, we the, the framework has provisions to curb on ethical tendencies. And so we would like to hear you out in the discussion board. Many of us have experiences in this, we are in the industry. And so thanks for giving the audience. See you in the next module. Bye.